Hailing frequencies open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and you know an episode is dark when you're digging a grave with a phaser, and even that doesn't work. I'm joined in this episode once again by Darren Mooney. Darren is a columnist, film critic, and YouTube host for The Escapist Magazine, and he's the co-host of the 250 podcast, a look at the top 250 films on IMDb. He's also an author. His latest book, Christopher Nolan, A Critical Study of the Films, tracks Nolan's career from film student to Oscar-nominated auteur. Darren, welcome back to the show. Hello. Um, I always feel slightly embarrassed when people read those kind of introductions. I'm like, is that me? Did I get the right Darren Mooney? But yes, I am thrilled to be back. Thank you for having me, Aaron. It's a huge pleasure. You deserve of all the glory laud and honor come on yeah i suppose i do um <laughs> you did the work you watched the christopher nolan movies wow <laughs> some of them several times um <laughs> yeah <laughs> and backwards and forwards um, and backwards and forwards yeah you have to it's great to have you back aboard uh today we'll be talking about that which survives the 17th episode of the third season of star trek the original series When filming began on Star Trek Season 3 in May of 1968, it was already a dead show walking. Though Star Trek had been saved from cancellation by enthusiastic fan letters after its second year, the sci-fi series faced some harsh realities going forward. Budgets were slashed by new corporate parent Paramount, the show was cursed with a Friday 10 p.m. death slot, and the creative visionaries who had given us some of Trek's best hours had quit and been replaced by budget-conscious jobbers who didn't understand the material. Perhaps worst of all, the great bird of the galaxy himself, Gene Roddenberry, had turned his back on the flailing series to pursue his next potential Hollywood success. It's fitting then, though possibly coincidental, that the third season of TOS is a mostly grim affair, filled with stories of death, ghosts, and dead or dying worlds, as if the series' numbered days and its increasing inability to comment on the events of its time both combined to produce an elegiac year of TV, one in which a hopeful and inspiring future is mired in its own sickness unto death. But we'll talk about that a little later in the show. First, Darren, it's great to have you back on board. And I'd like to begin, if I can, with a compliment. Uh, I think it's been just over two years that you've been writing for The Escapist, doing movie and TV reviews and commentary. And I have to say that I always look forward to your commentary uh, on movies and media, whether or not I agree with your opinions. (laughs) And uh, you are a part of a lot of The Escapist YouTube output as well. And I think that you've been a great fit for that. Thank you very much. No, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be part of it. I'm actually thrilled that people seem to enjoy it. And, you know, I mean, even when they don't enjoy it, I'm thrilled that they have strong opinions on it because it would be worse <laughs> yes. if they didn't enjoy it and didn't have any opinions on it whatsoever. Yes. Um, but I will actually, I will single out um, the particularly the YouTube stuff is certainly not all me. I am very much the the amateur on the team uh, working with a fan, phenomenal array of very qualified individuals there. So like my editor, Nick Calandra, who's the yeah. guy who like I, I pitch him every week I show up at his desk with like 20 pitches and he's like, that one, that one, that one. And don't come back to me with that one. Stop no, pitching me. Yeah. yeah, don't ever bring that back. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I know you love Michael B. Jordan, but I don't need five Michael B. Jordan pitches every week, Darren. I'm like, fine, but that's what the people want. Um, the wonderful Omar Ahmed, who does the editing uh, on the videos, particularly the in the frame videos, which release once every two weeks. Um, and I'm constantly in awe of, of his work there. I, I do not understand it. I do not understand how he does it so quickly. I don't understand how he does it so well. And I don't yeah. understand how he makes me seem coherent. I listen to it and I'm like, <laughs> that guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And I'm like, I... And I know that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, and yeah, then also yeah. just uh, Jack uh, Packard as well, who does the Escapist podcast with me. He's just a phenomenal uh, host and collaborator as well. So yeah, no, th- I'm very thrilled to be a-, a part of that as well. So thank you. And I'm really glad people are enjoying it as well. And I kind of, I, I enjoy when I get to throw like new commentary out there, but when I get to do old stuff as well. So I'll occasionally do something like Raiders of the Lost Ark and it's, it's just sure. great fun to tuck into that, you know. Uh, And it's interesting because you talk about people's responses, you know, obviously no response, the worst. Uh, Bad response, not as good as good response, but still some engagement, I suppose. Do you feel like, I I don't know, if you read the comments, do you feel like people agree with a lot of your opinions on uh, TV shows and films? Um, I, I do try to read the comments, if only yeah. to stay grounded and stay brave. humble, as it were. I, yeah, I know, very brave. And I do try to engage <laughs> where I can, because I work on the assumption that if people... Again, the internet is a machine that... Like, the, the Roger Ebert argument that cinema is a machine that generates empathy, the internet is a machine that drains empathy slowly out of every <laughs> living soul. Uh, in large part, I suspect, because a lot of it is done via text. You don't put a face to the person on the other yeah. end of the screen. Yeah. And I, I kind of hope, in my very naive sort of way, that if I can engage... 
um, I at least seem human to these people and I seem like somebody who is willing to not just ignore them or mute them or look away, but actually willing to kind of chat with them. Now, I will yeah. say that there are cases where it gets very intense and they're on subjects that I'm pretty sure you, you can imagine they are. So, you know, again, yeah. the... I think when I was on last time, um, it was off the back of the kind of piece I'd written about Discovery, which, uh, you know, and I, I, at the risk of, of, you know, not sounding humble, sounding very full of myself, I'm really proud of that uh, Discovery piece that I wrote. I, I yeah, think it it's a very good argument about what the show is doing, where it's positioned and how it falls in Star Trek lore. Yeah. And there were some people who respond to it going, actually, that's a really good argument and I get it and I see where you're coming from. And a lot of people shared it and there was a lot of discussion around that was very constructive. And the the problem, the fear with all this is the same thing that happens with, say, The Last Jedi or any internet thing is like when you focus on the people who are not being constructive, you tend to give them control of the narrative. But there yeah. was a big pushback I found that was really disheartening to me as somebody who had put a lot of thought into it, which was, but but you're forgetting that Discovery is garbage and trash and awful and it's not really Star Trek. And it's like, yeah. that, that's not that's not the argument I'm making here. Um, yeah. You know, I have complicated, like, feelings about Discovery as a whole, but my job here is not to stand on a mountain and to tell you that how you feel about a piece of media uh, is right or wrong. It's to say, no, this is a way of looking at a piece of media and hopefully either get you to engage with it or think about it or maybe kind of reflect on it in a way. Yeah, so yeah. some of that stuff is, I, I will admit, some of that stuff is kind of draining. I will admit, though, some of the stuff is, you know, water off a duck's back um, in a sense of it's quite hilarious when I open a comment that goes, this guy clearly knows nothing about comic books. And like, I live in a house made of comic books. <laughs> it's um, constructed. My, <laughs> literally constructed of old comic books. They're from the 90s. They were very cheap. It was cheaper than plywood um but i mean i also um like i think my partner at the time like i was i was with my partner doing something and i got like a twitter direct message or i got like an email something that popped up on my phone saying like you clearly don't know anything about comics and i had to worry about my partner like stopping breathing that they were laughing so hard at that <laughs> um but like you know so it's not it's not all bad and it doesn't all get me down and i do actually i do find that generally the constructive stuff is really fun and like i mean it's not it's not a case of I'm right and you're wrong, which I think is something that the internet, again, because we, we encourage communication to get shorter, because yeah. Twitter is 140 characters, because YouTube comments cut off the bottom of a comment once it runs over a certain amount of space. Right, right. We encourage people to get very succinct and very, you know, this yeah. is this is a statement of fact. I think there's a lot of nuance there. Like, there are... And, and I actually, I'm really, really flattered you, when you, you said, like, you don't always agree with me, but you find my writing of value. I, I feel the same way about any writer that I cherish. I, yeah. I don't think, like, I will never agree with Richard Brody writing at The New Yorker, but he is still <laughs> one of the best critics working. Um, huh. You know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's it's interesting too. like the volume of both good faith and bad faith criticism uh, to criticism or response to criticism can be equally as loud. But there's still a level of engagement that you would want to have, I would hope, with like fans of Discovery who disagree with your you know take on the direction of like say Star Trek Discovery uh, and like Zack Snyder fans, for instance, like it doesn't feel like there's going to be a lot of like uh, dialogue with Zack Snyder fans if you say you don't like batman versus superman or something like that yeah i mean again this is this is the weird thing where i i found that like and again this is this is a situation where you want to be very careful and you don't want to say both sides or anything like that like the sure you know f there are fandoms that are particularly awful and have done particularly awful and terrible things the the snyder fandoms harassment of journalists which is well documented is terrible the star wars fandoms harassment of women and people of color to the point of like hounding kelly marie tran off instagram <laughs> is yeah. is awful and and i don't want to be little or or diminish that in any way by saying yeah but all fandoms are kind of like that but i do find that any fandom when you critique their sacred horses or you particularly when mm. you critique a position that is seen as being a sacred horse uh, you will get a very strong pushback from so you will get pushback from snyder fans if you say like i do that man of steel is not a good movie uh, but you will also get pushback from marvel fans if you say something like yeah shang chi is is incredibly bland and generic and its attempts to emulate jackie chan are deeply frustrating because it refuses to like actually pay homage and instead just packages it as part of a larger mcdonald's style 
burger, um, yeah. which, you know, again, and again, like I get that, you know, certain fans won't agree with that and that's fine. And I'm glad that people get value out of it. But you say something like that and you feel the heat of the internet bearing down on you, no matter what it's in relation to, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, you write about a variety of topics. I was pleased to see recently that you did a piece on the recent and final Evangelion film, Thrice Upon a Time. And suffice it to say, listeners might, they might not be Evangelion fans if they're not. I mean, we do not have the time here to explain anything about that Tangle franchise, but we can talk about the idea of a creator revisiting the work that made them initially uh, from the creator of Evangelion, Hideaki Anno, to the Wachowskis with The Matrix, uh, to Lucas with Star Wars. Like, what do you think of creators saying, oh, uh, one more thing, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to uh, add another thing to this. Well, I, I think like the, the Lucas, it, I love that you threw Lucas in there because um, like the Lucas is kind of like the poison apple. It's the, it's the kind of cherry bomb in the <laughs> That's toilet. That's the trap. And that is the trap right there. It's a trap. Um, but like the, the Lucas thing is a problem, I would argue, because the originals are not available anywhere. Um, that is the big uh, problem yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with the Lucas vision is that like they are. And again, you know, I mean, there's that big argument about like the difference between cinematic restoration and kind of cinematic reimagining and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I do think like the big problem with Lucas is that it, the original unremastered versions of the trilogy are not legally available anywhere. They are available if you look online in the certain places, but we cannot endorse, cannot and do not endorse those um, yeah. for legal reasons. But I think that generally speaking, um, when it comes to older creators revisiting their, their kind of like past works, I'm generally down with that in that like, I think that like a work goes out into the world and it is obviously a snapshot of its time and place um, in that obviously, you know, we talk about Star Trek. I mean, last time I was on, we talked about the immunity syndrome and the immunity syndrome is, you know, 60s psychedelia. It's it's a piece of television that could not exist 10, 20, 30 years later. You could not make that episode of television and it would not feel the same way that it does. But mm. also when you send it out into the world, the world changes around it. And so the context kind of shifts and the meaning shifts as well. And I think it's always good to see a creator grapple with that. And I think, you know, you see it literally with, like, you mentioned the Evangelion rebuild, Evangelion rebuild. And, like, just very briefly, no actual plot synopsis, because, as you said, we don't have time. And also, yeah, I'm not sure that I could. Um, yeah, if could. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll need a blackboard. Uh, I'll need a blackboard and a piece of chalk. Several yes. colors, please. But, I mean, to, just to sum it up for people who are not aware. Um, Hideki Anu, um, during the 90s, um, wrote this kind of 26-episode anime series. Um, it was a work that was something that came from, in his own words, his own depression, his own sense of insecurity, his own sense of self, trying to put that out and trying to structure it through his own affection for mecha anime, which is traditionally anime about you know, kids who get into giant robots and punch stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and the, the, the show is fascinating because it, shifts now it's it's there from the outset but it really shifts in the middle and becomes this kind of introspective meditation on like what this means in the context of the narrative it's about like what this means for the children who are being turned into soldiers kind of a deconstruction of this right in a broader sense it becomes like anno himself seeming to ask as the creator of this show that is running weekly on japanese television and has a scheduled deadline for him to hit why the hell am i doing this and there are a number <laughs> of issues that affected its production uh famously it had to be dramatically retooled in the wake of the sarin nerve gas attacks on tokyo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um there were issues where like he said he didn't have an ending when he started which is a a problem when you're working on that tight a schedule um, and he ended the TV show and he ended the TV show with an ending that was largely about the main character kind of coming to peace with himself. Um, mm -hmm. Notably, the final two episodes of the show do not feature a single gigantic mech battle. They instead feature a complex meditation on the idea of self and identity um, and the role within the world. At which point, like at one point, the main character seems to imagine himself in like a completely different anime series. Right. Um, fans did not respond to this particularly no, well because like it that. turns out if you if you if you promise people giant mech battles, they expect giant mech battles. Yeah. So um, you know there were there were issues where he. He was he was threatened and he received kind of like emails not emails or letters uh telling him how to kill himself he's talked uh, in interviews since about how he had suicidal ideation like browsing message boards where there were suggestions on exactly how he could do it you had issues where like studio uh gynex i apologize if i'm mispronouncing this i'm a, I'm a prose uh critic rather than a, an audio yes. critic yeah. um but the the studio was like uh, vandalized and there was graffiti written on it and it was a, a huge source of kind of outrage and 
perhaps because the studio senses, sensed the opportunity to make a massive amount of money, they announced that the following year there would be a cinematic uh, ending to the show. And that ending was End of Evangelion, which is a fascinating film, uh, in large part because it seems to be immensely angry at its own existence. <laughs> yes. um, when you watch it, there's a real sense that Anno is like, why I don't want to do this. I was happy with the ending of the TV show. The characters yeah. found a happy ending. Why are you making me do this? So it becomes this, I think like one of the critics described it as one of the most sustained assaults on an audience in living memory. <laughs> yes. And I can kind of buy that. I think that's a fair description. I came into, I watched the entire show without knowing the production history behind it and i was like why is he doing this and then i read all the like coverage and interviews i'm like oh i see why he's doing Uh, this um but like there's a moment at the climax where like on screen he flashes all the like threats that he received he flashes the graffiti um at one stage he even shows an audience sitting in a cinema watching the movie presumably so you have like if when they were screened in cinemas you would have cinema audiences staring at themselves uh, which seemed like a real kind of like take a real look at yourselves kind of moment Um, and it's this really angry really bitter piece and then Anno kind of, you know, goes away and, and kind of he's wrapped up. He's wrapped up work on that. He does other stuff. Um, and eventually he comes back and he says, actually, I would like to take another go at making um, Evangelion. Like, I would like yeah. to start from scratch. I'd like to reimagine it because I'm an artist who's in a different place now, psychologically. He had, in the years since, got married. Um, he treated his depression. Um, his friendship with Hayao Miyazaki was apparently much stronger than ever. I mean, I think this is around the time that they, like, went to the Sahara together. If you ever want to feel good about yourself, watch Hideki Anu and uh, Hayao Miyazaki like in the Sahara Desert being old (laughs) men. It's like a Japanese version of the trip. It's fantastic. Um, But (laughs) but like, so he's like, yeah, I want to take it from scratch and I want to do it. And he just, he rewrites it basically. And it's interesting because the, these four movies released in cinemas uh, initially seem like they're going to just be straight up adaptations. And then the second one branches off like, it starts off with a slight branch and then over the course of the second movie it kind of cascades to the point where like the entire premise seems to be blown up as the, like the credits roll on the second of four movies and then yeah. the third and fourth are like about trying to piece it back together and like what Anno does at the end of, of the last Evangelion movie um, is that he basically goes back to the same themes uh, of the ending to the anime show and of Evangelion. And he approaches them in a way that, like, I find kind of heartening. As a, He's an older man at this stage. He's, you know, yeah. what at this stage, 24 years older. And he's, it's more mellow. It's more gentle. It's kinder. And, like, watching it, you get this real vicarious sense of, I do not know Anno. Um, I don't know Anno from Adam. I don't know anything about him personally. But just watching it, you get a sense that, as an artist, he seems like, this seems like the work of somebody who is in a much happier place. And I think sure. he has said as much. Um And I find that fascinating with artists when they revisit old material. And I think, like, it doesn't have to be as direct as, like, I am literally remaking this thing that I made as a kid. I think, like, say, Clint Eastwood, uh, where Clint Eastwood, as, as a director, as he's gotten older, and he is a divisive figure and a complicated figure... But I do think that you look at his later work, uh, and I mean, when I say later work, I mean arguably anything from the 80s onwards, but particularly, say, Mm -hmm. movies like Unforgiven or even The Mule more recently, uh, where he seems to be interrogating and exploring what his early Western work means. It's like he's figuring out what he means in terms of pop culture, like what he said and how that affects the world today. And I, I find that kind of fascinating. And I think that we're living in a world where franchises are incredibly dominant. And I mean, it's it's worth noting that I think within the past 10 years, it seems like every franchise has had a 50th anniversary. Star Trek is a big one. Uh, obviously, you know, Doctor Who, all that sort of yeah. stuff. Uh, the Marvel yeah. comics all had their 50th anniversary and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it kind of re- it, it reinforces the idea that we're living in a world where modern pop culture now has these long-running franchises where like in the 60s and 70s you would invent these things from scratch and they would be new and they would maybe like engage or play with older ideas like the hulk you know would be an idea where you play with dr jekyll and mr hyde or the werewolf or monsters whereas now you just make another hulk movie you just publish another hulk comic yeah and i think that as we like as a culture and as we become like increasingly fixated with these franchises using those franchises as vehicles to do that is interesting because it means that instead of Clint Eastwood playing with the idea of Clint Eastwood, it's instead, no, you actually, you take Star Wars uh, and you 
sit down and you figure out what Star Wars means in Star Wars in, say, The Last Jedi. Or you take Mm -hmm. Star Trek and you figure out, like, what Star Trek means and kind of explore that sort of thing, um, which I find fascinating. I think (laughs) that's that's kind of what I find fascinating about this reflexive quality is that it's always been there in art. But I think it's interesting that we now see it through the lens of franchising, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Well, I want to congratulate you on the 250th episode of your podcast, The 250, where you talk about the IMDb 250, and the 250th episode is about Tenet, no less, and you do it backwards. We do. Um, we thought it was kind of a fun thing to do. Again, it, it's one of the things, it's, Tenet is not on the 250, has never been on the 250. It is the first <laughs> Christopher Nolan movie since, I think, um, what's Insomnia, not to make the 250, which is kind of fascinating of itself yeah. in terms of like a cultural watermark. Um, yeah. And we just, myself and Andrew, my co-host, just kind of, we saw the movie, we loved the movie, and we thought it'd be fun to talk about. And for all our, you know, landmark episodes we have done something that is profoundly misguided um so for example (laughs) for our 100th episode we did inception and we worked with four other irish podcasts and then kind of went level by level deeper into them so we would incept them so we kind of restarted the episode yes. four times uh, on like four different Irish podcasts, some of which weren't even related to films. We were very proud of that um, and managed managed to convince a bunch of co-hosts to sign on, off on that, which was kind of impressive. I love that the Irish industry is so small that people were like, that's a good idea, as opposed to get the hell out of our office. Um, and then we had uh, for our 200th episode, we did Goodfellas, uh, which was um, where we did it in the style of Goodfellas, uh, which was yeah. slightly insane. And then Tenet was just a bit of an easy one because we just took the structure of the podcast and just ran it backwards. Yeah, but it was kind yeah. of a, it was kind of a fun one because we got to we got to end we got to start with the actual like big important thematic discussion of like the movie and what it represents, and then close with all the kind of boring productiony stuff that we normally do to the point yeah. where I'm sitting. Why don't I just do this normally? anyway why do i why do i start with like boring stuff about who directed this and the production team and stuff like that but no yeah. it, it, it's good it's amazing i cannot believe we've done 250 uh, episodes of it uh, and credit yeah. to my co-host andrew quinn there because he was the podcast was his idea um the drive behind it was his he, he was the one who sat down and said we should do it he's the one who's had every insane idea that has turned out to work really well has been andrew's every insane <laughs> idea insane idea that has not worked has turned out to be mine um sure. but it was <laughs> That was great. Like he's he's the one who came up with the eighteen hour Twin Peaks podcast that we did for charity. We oh, did yeah. eighteen hours live Twin Peaks podcast on the return because the joke being Twin Peaks the return is really the best movie of like twenty seventeen. Uh, it is not a <laughs> sure. movie, but we figured, yeah. hey, if we're gonna talk about it like a movie, we're gonna do the thing where we talk about the movie for roughly as long as the movie is. So we're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, we'll do eighteen straight hours. Um talking about it but it was good fun um so no i i'm thrilled people seem to enjoy it i'm thrilled uh that people listen to it i'm thrilled that i'm still doing it and i'm thrilled that we get the guests that we have who are always fantastic and i'm thrilled that my co-host uh is still involved and it's like is still as enthusiastic to do as i am so again insane i would not have thought that i was doing this five years ago i would not have thought that we would hit 250 i think the average podcast length is six episodes is it really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most pro- podcasts. I wish somebody die. told me. Yeah. <laughs> Most podcasts, I think, die about six episodes. That's that's the thing is that like it's because there are so many. Like so many people start podcasts and then obviously oh. just kind of give up after a while. Yeah. So it distorts the average length. But it's like yeah, it's it's also like really heartening when you look at like average listenership stats because there are so many of those podcasts that only ran six episodes. So it's yeah. very easy to like perform well above the average to podcast listenership. Yeah. Um, it makes it really inflates my sense of self esteem. It's like. Nobody listens to us, but we are still like a hundred times as popular as the average podcast. Um. Sometimes I wish I had thought to stop after six episodes, but still, still here. You chose this episode, That Which Survives, to talk about today, but it's really in service of a larger conversation that I wanted to have with you about your opinions and ideas about the third season of the original series. And it's a season that's, you know, it's no surprise, it's not exactly held in high regard by audiences. Of course, it was saddled with a lot of problems and budget problems, creative problems. But narratively, and you've pointed this out before, it seems preoccupied with decay and disease and death. I mean, even Abraham Lincoln can't lighten the mood. Yeah, and I mean, Abraham Lincoln was one of the great prop comics of our time. That chair is just like, it, it's <laughs> yeah, a key it's, part of what makes it appeal. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's doing all the work. It is, it is. I mean, like, this is the thing with, with the third season. I think the third season is interesting in that, like, this is one of those Darren hot takes where I think the third season gets a little bit of a bum rap. I'm not going to be that hot. I'm not going to come in scorching. I do think the general assessment <laughs> that it season. is. It, yeah, yeah, I know. There, there's the really hot take. I think it is It is by far the weakest season. I think that assessment of it is correct. I think there are very serious problems with it. I think it has like some really terrible, terrible episodes in it. I think it lacks the like build 
that the first season had where if you watch the first season from beginning to end it just seems to get progressively better and better and better and then operation yeah. annihilate happens and you just pretend that the season ended on the city on the edge of forever but like right. then you watch the second season and the second season is really good because it has like all of its good episodes are generally in a cluster they're like the gene l coon episodes and mm. then you can kind of like drift off a little bit when you get towards the end and yeah. it's like it gets a bit ropey and you're like gamesters of triskillian um so i think the third ep- the third season is a bit more of a problem because like the good and the bad episodes are mixed in together and the bad episodes are truly soul destroyingly terrible <laughs> and more than that like they're they're soul destroyingly terrible but they're soul destroyingly terrible in a way that isn't like oh this is boring nobody ever talks about this they're soul destroyingly terrible in that they are not only like boring and terrible and awful but they're also distinctly memorable so everybody remembers how terrible the third season is because they yeah. remember uh you know they remember the way to eden for example yeah. uh, they remember and the children shall lead they remember the paradise syndrome they remember all of this stuff kind of in the season that it, they remember turnabout intruder you yeah. don't forget these things and so it kind of lodges in the memory but before we move on like in defense of the third season and this is this is kind of my hot take i find it fascinating how much of what we think of as fundamental to star trek can be traced back to the third season so i think if you were to say uh klingons and you think of klingons i think that kang is the the original series klingon who is closest to what many people or many Star Trek fans would describe as a Klingon today. I think he's closer okay. than Kor. I think he's closer than Koloff. I think yeah. you can draw a straight line from his characterization, Day of the Dove, as a man of honor and integrity through to what Ronald D. Moore does when he turns them into, I believe, was a Viking samurai bikers, is how he describes <laughs> yeah. his work. Yeah. Um, I think that you look at things like, say, um, obviously the... The weird utopianism, like the utopianism of Star Trek, the idea that the Federation and Starfleet are unequivocally good and they are paradise is something that I think really gets hammered uh, in the third season. Mm. I think that when you look at the first and second seasons, particularly as overseen by Gene Alcoon, there tends to be a cynicism about Starfleet and the Federation, like Journey to Babel is the best example. You look at Journey to Babel, you look at Journey to Babel, and you see the Federation as a body that seems to be at its own throat. Like, these Mm -hmm. are nations and races that do not like each other. And they've kind of been forced into this unlikely alliance where they all seem to be scheming against one another. And then you go to the third season and you look at things like, say, like Lights of Zotara suggesting Memory Alpha, where it's like the Federation is working together to build this repository of knowledge. You look yeah. at things like uh, Is There in Truth No Beauty, which introduces the concept of the IDEC, uh, infinite diversity in infinite combinations. Yeah. Um, you kind of have this idea that the future is utopian. You also have like other aspects of Star Trek that tend to become more mimetic. Like it's notable that, I mean, I know that, the cage obviously had you know an orion slave girl and therefore the menagerie also had an orion slave girl but kirk's interaction with an orion slave girl in whom the gods first destroy that's that's the first time that that happens you have the idea of kirk becoming a ladies man in the third season which is the characterization of (laughs) kirk that really kind of stays when people think of kirk they think of kirk as this lothario which is very different from how he's portrayed in the first season like you know yeah. in um in where no man has gone before like there's this sense of him as like a stack of books with legs i think is how he's described uh, in shore leave he's dealing with his bully in the academy whereas you jump yeah. to the third season all of a sudden kirk is like wrestling with sexy women on knives on beds every second episode yeah and so you have this idea i think of a lot of what we associate with star trek ends up coming whether intentionally or not, from the third season of television. It ends up kind of like defining the franchise and kind of codifying the franchise going forward. I mean, arguably, even the imagery. Like, when people think of Star Trek as an allegorical TV show or a metaphorical TV show or show the pedals in metaphors for things like racism, which image do they pull from? They pull yeah, from... Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, not a good episode of television, no. to be clear, but no. it, it's the one that sticks in the memory. So I, I find it fascinating how much of the cultural and fan memory of what Star Trek is can be derived from these episodes in this season. Um, which, again, it's something that I think gets overlooked when talking about kind of this stretch of the show, perhaps. That's interesting. 
Well, we are talking about the TOS episode, That Which Survives, the 17th episode of the third season of TOS. It first aired on January 24th of 1969. The teleplay for the episode is by John Meredith Lucas. This was Lucas's fourth writing job for TOS. He pre previously had the sole writing duties on the episodes The Changeling, Patterns of Force, and Elan of Troyes. He also directed three episodes of TOS, Elan, The Ultimate Computer, and The Enterprise Incident, which is the last time that we talked about him on this show in our fourth season. Uh, he also directed part of a day on the second season episode, The Obsession, when director Ralph Zineski uh, took off to observe Yom Kippur. Despite this being only the second time he's come up on the show, Lucas was an important part of the Trek universe. He replaced Gene Kuhn as showrunner of Star Trek after Kuhn left midway through the second season. Uh, he himself was replaced by Fred Freiberger for the show's third season, but he continued to write and direct for TOS in its third season. But he was effectively barred from directing any mid or late season episodes by Paramount because he went over time and over budget on Elon of Troyes. Um, and I'm not sure that that is a huge loss uh, in terms of him being a director, but it is uh, one of the really petty choices that you see coming from uh, the corporate masters in season three. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, and again, to, to give credit to Lucas, I think it's, the fact is he's arguably the first Star Trek auteur in that, like, Alan, Alan of Troyes is written and directed by Lucas. Sure. So he's the first uh, Star Trek creator to write and direct a single piece of Star Trek as well to give him some credit there. And yeah. you can arguably, if you want, and again, we'll, we'll come back to uh, the credited story ender, Michael Richards, uh, Kramer from <laughs> Seinfeld, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, we'll come back yes. to who that really was uh, yes. in, a, in a moment. But in terms of like his teleplay for this episode, I think you can actually like, again, trace ideas here that go back to like the late second season um when he was showrunner i think that like this is very much of a piece with things like gamesters of triskillian for example mm -hmm. um episodes like obsession with the vampire cloud and the nightmare yeah. all yeah. that sort of stuff like even even the deadly years all that sort of stuff i think that you can kind of see um things that interest lucas about star trek in this episode as a writer um i do think you're right though in terms of director i'm not entirely sure that i would single him out as a great director um yeah. of star trek like i think serensky is a much stronger director um, yeah yeah but i mean at this point they they need directors <laughs> on season yeah. three and what? they just said no no more from you yeah well i mean like again serensky is, is kind of like given his walking papers in the um in the tholian web if i remember correctly he's like he's he's basically yes. kind of marched off set because he ran uh, half a day over schedule or something like that due to yeah. like some sort of problem they had in the morning well it's supposedly it's you know jerry finnerman had left at that point and al francis comes on as the director of photography and what i've read is that francis you know was obviously inexperienced on this particular show and needed a little more time to get the light and everything set up and so he gave him that latitude but then that pushed them you know half a day over schedule and at that point it was boom no you're gone yeah. which again is, is very like you mentioned it in the intro to like the the kind of the the segment which I, an hour ago half an hour ago however long it feels <laughs> to listeners a little, um, little while ago a little while ago sorry apologies about that but i mean i think um you were entirely right like there is this incredible brain drain um not to get all spock's brain on the third season but you have all brain. these like people who like people who were instrumental to making star trek what it was who yeah. end up being pushed away or alienated whether by the creative choices involved or budgetary concerns or as you point out like the tightening of the financial leash so you have things like i mean and again we'll, we'll come back to it but this is like dc fontana uh, was responsible for the story of this and then just kind of walked away because she felt like she wasn't able to kind of fulfill her vision on it she felt like she was being overruled or ignored by freeburger you have things yeah. like david gerald like later in the season um on the cloud miners talking about how he was deeply frustrated uh working with freeburger as well how he couldn't get that across you have like yeah you have this kind of sense of all these incredibly talented people who were responsible for making Star Trek what it was, but unable, not not working on it in its third season when it arguably needed them most. I think like Gene Alcoon is, is one example where he ends up writing episodes, but he writes them under a pseudonym because he can't, you know, he, he can't, he isn't free to come back basically. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you have this kind of real sense of, of the show feeling abandoned and empty and again part of that is obviously budgetary and that like they know not, not that they ever really had a huge budget on the show but they <laughs> right. no longer have the budget to imply extra extras to walk around sets so the enterprise suddenly feels a lot quieter the corridors are a lot emptier it feels more like a ghost ship 
the yeah. planet sets are, are you know typically restaged kind of you know the, the old studio set that they had but like again abandoned empty only one or two featured guest stars at a time so these are frequently dead or dying worlds these sets yes. are largely empty yes. and uninhabited uh, yeah. and so you have this weird sense of it kind of like filtering down where it feels almost like a metaphor for what is happening with the show itself um like i mean like you could argue that which survives which again and again not we'll talk about the episode more in a moment like when i was talking about the immunity syndrome i described the immunity syndrome as a masterpiece which i think is sorely underrated by star trek fandom i do not think that which survives is a masterpiece (laughs) to be clear i think it has some very serious problems uh in particular say its characterization of spock i think like fontana leaving you feel the absence of fontana from this script in a very tangible sense certainly Um, certainly but I do think that it is like an interesting episode because it, it feels like it's tied to all this stuff that is happening to the point where like the central premise of the episode is that Kirk and the crew, have, Kirk and his away team beam down to a planet that is not real, that does not exist, yes. that might as well have been built on a soundstage. It makes yeah. no physical sense whatsoever. They beam down and like the ground starts shaking because it's one of Matt Jeffrey's kind of creations. But the entire yeah. point is they're wandering around a set, figuring, trying to figure out how any of this makes any sense. It has this kind of surreal abstract quality that runs through a lot of the third season. And again, like, I'm not going to pretend that this was some sort of genius avant-garde thing where the production team sat down and said, this is what we should do. Right. Um, much like I think, like, you know, the, the famous story about, like, the abstract lighting on the Enterprise, particularly in the first season. So where you'd have, like, green spotlights against a gray wall or blue spotlights or red spotlights was apparently yeah. uh, not motivated by any artistic decision, but motivated in order to justify selling this as a color tv show yeah and to right. it like use it On to NBC. sell color yeah. Te- yeah use it to sell <laughs> yeah. color televisions but i think that like you look at the third season and you have this like level of abstraction in say specter of the gun where sure. like you have this western town it's a wild west set it's, it's a, yeah, yeah it's, it's a wild west set and it's like only half saddles <laughs> yeah the half constructed kind of sets uh, because they can't afford to properly build a Western <laughs> town. And you yeah. have things like, say, the Empath uh, in the season as well, where it yeah. entirely takes place in what looks like like a student theater. Like you've been to college right. theater. It looks like a college theater space. It's like and, a Batman episode. The villain's lair is just a black box theater yeah. set. Yeah, that's, that's it. Like it's a Batman like on a budget. It's like, it's like lower yeah. than the third season of Batman. And yeah. so I kind of, I like that that theme of performance and artifice whether intentionally or not ends up becoming a recurring motif in the third season and you can arguably kind of see it are in in that which survives which is like kirk Kirk beams down to a planet that isn't really a planet but is instead a constructed space and trying to figure out what's going on and how you know i mean like the opening line this episode is a ghost planet um, yeah, and I'm, ghosts, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm very disappointed that they didn't go a g- g- ghost planet. Um, <laughs> yes, but like just in case you don't get that this is like this is a horror story, so to speak, or yeah. kind of like a ghost story. They literally have Kirk say, "Ghosts, right? That's what we're doing this week." Ghosts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Just fill you in at the beginning yeah. here. A ghost planet. Yeah, Continue. Ghost. Like, I, I doubt Spock described it as a ghost planet, but like, yes. Particularly when like you get Spock's description of it later, like uh, moments later, where when Spock's like, "What I said was X," and it's like, yeah. I don't see how Kirk made the leap to ghost planet. Like sure. it's like, yeah, it's it's like it's a planet that you know is is too young, and it's like okay. It's a planet that is uh, the same size as Earth's moon, but has Earth's atmosphere. It's like, okay, that's that's weird. I, I, I don't know where you're getting ghosts from. It's not translucent. It's <laughs> yes. not a planet that you thought was it dead. Go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not shimmering on screen. Like, yeah. I feel like you've encountered things, Kirk, that are like you could yes. more accurately describe as ghosts. Yes, you know we went to the Macbeth planet. This is not a ghost planet. Yeah. You had yeah. Jack the Ripper in your computer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you mentioned before, it's interesting the tortured history of the name Michael Richards has had in Hollywood, especially lately. <laughs> but uh, Michael Richards wrote the story. It's, of course, a pseudonym for Dorothy Fontana, who developed the story from a similar pitch from Gene Roddenberry's original pitch doc for the series, Star Trek Is. And she requested that her pseudonym that she usually uses uh, be used. Uh, it's actually the names of both of her brothers because she was dissatisfied with the alterations made to the script. The d- episode was directed by Herb Wallerstein, who directed uh, four episodes total of the third season, including The Tholian Web, Whom Gods Destroy, and Turnabout Intruder. And as we were just talking about, uh, he replaced Ralph Seneski on The Tholian Web uh, when he was fired by Fred Freiberger. 
Uh, there is no start date for this episode, and your assignment, Darren, if you can, is to give us a 25-word synopsis of that which survives. G -g -g ghost planets! <laughs> I can keep saying g -g 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 until I hit 25, if that helps. 25, yeah, 20, <laughs> yeah, 23 g -g -g -g's and then uh, and then Ghost Planet, yes. Uh, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, here are some interesting facts from the memory banks about this episode. And you were talking about extras before. Red shirts, you're safe from here on. This is the last episode of yes. TOS in which Enterprise crew members are shown to die. It's also the last episode of TOS to have an unknown star date. Uh, you were talking before about Matt Jeffries, and he did design a rocker plate set for this episode. No idea where they got the money for that, but it did allow them to simulate an energetic earthquake as seen in the episode's opening. Uh, it's also the first appearance of the access tube set, which provides access to the matter-antimatter reaction chamber. And I think it's interesting. It's it's like the first Jeffries tube, but instead of being angled, it's completely vertical and similar to how most Jeffries tubes are depicted in later series. Uh, uh, I just want to flat shout out, by the way, while we're yeah. talking about it, the way in which like Scotty has two assistants to like lift him they into feed it. Feed him in which, there. Which yeah. I kind like, I love the idea that the show the show couldn't afford that many extras. Um, so it's like no, no, but we need two to just vertically arrange Scotty. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> load him in like a torpedo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, additionally, the central brain chamber was created specifically for this episode, but the bypass valve room set was a reuse of the Unadin control room from For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky. And it's funny, this is an episode about a hollow planet, but it's more The World is Hollow and Catwoman Touched This Guy. Yeah, I believe this is the first of three episodes, three consecutive episodes with a Batman guest star, right? Yes, yes it is. Uh, of course, you've got before this, Frank Gorshin in Let oh, This sorry, Be Your sorry, Last sorry, Battlefield. Sorry. And then uh, after this, you've got uh, Yvonne Craig in Whom Gods Destroy, who I think that is the best episode of Batman that was never an episode of Batman, Whom Gods Destroy. That's a good point. Like, to be fair, like, there is there is a lot of that there in terms of production design of the show, as you point out, like, the, the idea of the empath being a Batman villain set, but where you have, like, the idea of there are... It's just cardboard or plywood walls, and you have to yes. project light or paint them primary colors. It yes. is a very Batman vibe to a be A lot there. of time spent in the villain's lair. Yeah, if the Joker got his hands on something that could make him change his shape, you'd just have a Batman episode. Uh, this is apparently the second time that we see Enterprise crew members burying their fallen. We saw it previously in the Galileo 7, when Latimer and Gatano were buried at the Galileo crash site. And just a little note about math here. I don't know about Hollywood math or accounting, but uh, at Warp 8.4, uh, traveling 990.7 light years would take 1.67 years, not 11.33 hours, as stated in the episode. And the math that I saw said that they would have to go warp 91.5 on a, a geometric and not an exponential <laughs> scale, I guess, in order to get there in 11 hours. So... I don't know. Sometimes people don't know the distances in Trek. Space is very big. Um, it's, yeah. You know, the, the maths It could be have been 90 light years, if it had to be 990. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, point, point 0.7 is like, again, we should, yeah, just very briefly talk about the Spock stuff in this episode, which is the bit that really feels like, again, I don't know the particulars of why Fontana kind of left. I think she said it wasn't worth an ulcer. That was her yes. take in terms of yes, like, well, that was that. a great yeah. star log quote was like yeah. staying on Star Trek was not worth the ulcer for the work that I was going to be doing. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> to, to, like, and again, I, this is the thing where I don't want to be. Freeburger is an interesting character in terms of like Star Trek history and continuity in large part because he is a journeyman television producer. Like you look at his life and his career and it includes shows like, you know, Ben Casey, The Wild Wild West, Space yeah. 1999 and stuff. I think yeah. he contributed scripts to dozens of television shows. Like I, the, the Wikipedia entry, you know, says he was active between 52 and 89. Star mm. Trek was, was kind of really just a job to him. Yeah, it was a stop and on the way. That, that That's it, exactly. And I kind of like, when I look at how... I kind of find myself fascinated by the fact that Freeburger never really gets a chance to set his own narrative. What tends to happen is you have the people who fell out with Freeburger and who tend to stay around the franchise get to set the narrative around him. So you have yeah. DC Fontana, obviously, who, you know, leaves here and then comes back for the animated series and comes back for the next generation and is rightly regarded as like a fantastic television writer so she gets to talk about how she was frustrated working with Freeburger. you have gerald who works on the animated series and then comes back very briefly for the next generation and is like yeah the uh, Freeburger was a, a huge problem for me to work with and you have kind of like justman as well who's, who's like yeah no I, I wasn't actively involved but you know i kind of i came back for the next generation and Freeburger was also a problem and, and i find and Freeburger got the job that he 
wanted yeah. and he thought he was promised yeah yeah and i kind of like i find myself a little bit sympathetic to the kind of free burger in terms of like a lot of the stuff that you you read often seems like free burger has been put between a rock and a hard place so yeah. you have things like say the the disagreement between i think nimoy and kind of uh shatner at the start of the third season where you read accounts of that where like they go to roddenberry roddenberry tells them to go to free burger and free burger tells them he has no idea how to solve this disagreement yeah. that's happening between <laughs> yeah. them yeah um you have kind of like arguments about like Freeburger being the guy who pushes for and again like you have this this thing where as I mentioned this is the third season the point at which you get Kirk and Spock being very sexual characters um, and being like characters who are sex symbols and I mean like they were beforehand and obviously Spock had a huge fandom and Spock was seen as being a very sexy character but like Freeburger is really the kind of like showrunner who taps into that and is like yeah let's actually do like the enterprise incident which is like what if spock seduced uh somebody you know and you have like the cloud minders which is like what if kirk and spock went on a double date but also communism um which is, you know, kind <laughs> yeah. Of a, yeah that's it <laughs> but, but like you have this kind of idea of Freeburger, kind of like pushing towards wanting star trek to kind of to appeal to a mass audience and i find i think like if you want to be charitable to Freeburger, if you want to make an argument for Freeburger, I think you could argue that, like, with the third season of Star Trek, he, A, had no real idea what he was doing from the start. And I think it's interesting that so many of his early decisions seem to be, like, largely deferential to Roddenberry in absentia. So things like, I know the Paradise Syndrome was a script that Roddenberry was really aggressively pushing to get made. And I love that, like, I think, is it, is it Margaret Ammons? Like, he didn't really feel that strongly about it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but he pushed it through because Roddenberry wanted it. And he had no <laughs> idea, like, what Star Trek was at that point. Yeah. But you, you have things like, I think, Margaret Armin talking about how, like, Freeburger was conscious of what sponsors' wives wanted to see on Star Trek, which felt like a very dismissive kind of, <laughs> like it's a really dismissive kind of criticism of like a version of Star Trek where it's like he's not making it for the fans, he's making right. it for sponsors' wives, and it's like I I, I kind of get the sense that maybe he was trying to make it for like the women staying at home audience in general, and that was kind of what he was trying to do rather than kind of flippantly dismissing it, and like I think. And again, to be clear, Fontana is, like, one of the great Star Trek writers. And, like, by default, her side of this argument is the right one. But I do think that there is something interesting in Freeburger's comments, I believe, to Starlog in one of the rare interviews that he gave about, like, being showrunner on Star Trek. uh, When he basically made the point that, like, she was not used to not being story editor on Star Trek during the third season. That, like, the source of tension between him and Fontana was largely down to the fact that, like, because she had been around since the start and because she had worked so closely with Roddenberry, she was story editor. She got to not only, you know, work on her scripts, but on other people's scripts and set the tone of the show. And transitioning from that role back into effectively a freelancer was a source of tension between the two. And yeah. I think maybe that that explains it. I've always, like, that's the thing with the third season is I find myself kind of, anxious around the traditional narrative that kind of paints Freeburger as the monster who is responsible for everything wrong with it I tend to be a bit more sympathetic and kind of go I feel like there were a variety of factors at play that led to the results that we got and I don't think that there is a single villain that you can point a finger at I suspect Freeburger was trying to do the best job that he could with the material that he had and dealing with a difficult situation a hot potato that had been thrown into his hands and I think I'm I'm hesitant to just kind of blame him as this kind of scapegoat, particularly because what happens is that narrative gets set during the 80s when you've got like fan conventions and you've got like books being written and they're being yeah, written yeah, by yeah. the people who yeah. the people who stuck around. Who stuck they're around, the people who get yeah. To, yeah, like the people who are still doing Star Trek get to set and make the history. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, perhaps as, as like Gene Roddenberry's accounting of Star Trek history in that period suggests, um, people who do that are, are perhaps reticent to accept that there are complicated factors that maybe implicate them as well in there. But yeah, yeah. I, I, I do think like while Fontana is, is one of the kind of great Star Trek writers, I, I'm hesitant to just kind of say Freeburg is, is the bad guy. It's a mustache twirling villain here. 
Oh, certainly not. It reminds me of the situation with uh, Maury Hurley's uh, tenure as showrunner of TNG, where he inherited essentially the show from an ailing Gene and felt like a custodian and felt like he would, had to protect Gene's idea. And so as the show is struggling to evolve, people are bringing him ideas and he's like, no, no, we can't do that. That's not Star Trek. This this thing, yeah. this paper that I've got here, this post-it note is Star Trek. And, it, you know, it's the same thing. And eventually, you know, he was replaced by Pillar and the show did continue to grow. But well, having... I mean, like, it's, worth, it's worth noting, like, that the, the, the tension that we mentioned between Freeburger and Gerald, like, that, that tension was over comedy. Because Gerald mm-hmm. had come to Freeburger and had pitched, I think, more tribbles, more troubles. Um, right, yeah. And, like, yeah. Which, which I think he would eventually develop into an animated series episode. But Freeburger yeah. had said, no, Star Trek's not a comedy. And that is, that's a Roddenberry line. Yeah, that like, that yeah, was like Roddenberry certainly. came back from Robin Hood and, you know, basically pushed Coon out the door because Star Trek is not a commentary, a comedy. And he responded to like things like, you know, uh, the trouble with Tribbles, um, things like I Mud and kind of said, no, that's not what Star Trek is. So, like, I, again, I, yeah. I get the sense that Freeberg is the bad guy is is an easy narrative for the problems with this season of television. Yeah. Uh, having Arthur Singer as the script supervisor yes. is probably a factor as well. Certainly when, um, you know, this episode feels wrong in a lot of yes, ways to does. quote Scotty. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of that would be, um, just Spock's strange yes. attitude throughout the data. Uh, episode. Yeah. Spock is, is completely oblivious and data. Both Kirk and Scotty are kind of harsh with their subordinates. Um, of course, there's the whole thing about, you know, 990 light years. You know, 0. 0.7, 0. 0.37. Yes, right. Sorry. I, you I mean 12 you minutes. More precise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, maybe a more uh, seasoned script supervisor would be able to tone some of that stuff down. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like, I think I think that is that is the problem. And I, again, this is one of the things where the episode feels like a metaphor for itself. Because, like, the, the central... The, and again, this is the thing where... When I argued about Star Trek Discovery, and one of the things I kind of admire about the first season of Star Trek Discovery is that it kind of taps into the existential horror that informs so much of the original Star Trek. Like, largely outside of Gene L. Coon's tenure as showrunner, Star Mm. Trek, the original series, often feels like this nightmare about, like, wandering through a dead or dying universe that does not care (laughs) about human life one whit. Like, they're constantly arriving... In civilizations that have collapsed and decayed, again, reflecting 60s anxieties about annihilation and kind of nuclear destruction. And it, yeah. it happens particularly in the in the third season. I mean, like you look at things, the Tholian Web is a, a story about a ghost ship. Uh, the Lights of Zatar is a, an exorcism in space story, for example. Yeah. Spectre of a Gun, again, is a literal ghost story. And you have like here, that which survives is is a siren story. Like it's, it's and not only mm-hmm. that, I mean, the Syrah is named for Osiris, who is the the god of the dead but you have this idea like is a dead world it's a ghost planet but the idea that like at one stage like the lab sorry the the helmswoman of the 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 helms person or helmsman of the enterprise says the stars are wrong which is a very curious (laughs) bit of phrasing because it's not we're in the wrong position it's not like we're not where we're supposed to be it's the stars are wrong which seems like an existential kind of like like jack the ripper in your computer like what Whatever the hell was happening in Cat's Paw, um, it yeah. seems like something that is like fundamentally broken and wrong. And you have here, like you, you made the analogy yourself there, the idea that the Enterprise has been taken apart and put back together wrong uh, and in ways that are like almost imperceptible. Like Scotty can kind of feel that the Enterprise isn't the ship that it was. It mm-hmm. kind of feels like that's what Star Trek is at this point in its third season, where it it is Nimoy, it is Shatner, it is Doohan, it is the standing sets, but it's yeah. not quite right, which I find fascinating. And of course, a lot of that is, you know, just the heart, as we've said, of the show being sort of gone or, yeah. or, or ripped out of it. You know, last time we talked about um, TOS's view of the future, you'd written an article uh, about about season three of Discovery and how the new series idea of a utopia and how that utopia is is achieved is still sort of old fashioned is still toward, sort of cleaving to what uh, TOS's kind of vision for the future is and it's a vision that uh, we've talked about and, and you've written about previously um, that that was. The dream of like uh, the greatest generation guys that fought in World War II and are trying to make this show about the future 
in a present that is quickly leaving them behind that is, you know, psychedelic and there's a sweeping counterculture movement, you know, outside the studio. And Star Trek is doing pro-Vietnam episodes and making fun of hippies. And there's a there's a disconnect there. And I wonder how much that feeds into the third season's idea of something slipping away or something being wrong or losing something. Well, I mean, like, you're right. This is the third the season that features the way to Eden. You know, like, like yeah, you, right. you're never going to get a finer point on, like, Star Trek's interesting relationship with counterculture than watching, yeah. like, the way to Eden, uh, in which a bunch of space hippies, like, hijack the Enterprise and then get killed at the end. <laughs> they but all you, die. But yeah. They all die. But, you, like, and, and the weird thing about that episode is that, yes, that, that, that is an incredibly cynical take on counterculture, but also the episode goes out of its way to have Spock like understand the hippies. No, I'm cool. Yeah, yeah like that. <laughs> right. it's, a weird, like, it's a very weird distance. It's, it's that thing that you mentioned, which is like, it's not entirely sure where it stands. And like, again, it's worth noting how often in Star Trek, uh, in the original series in particular, sorry, every time I say Star Trek, I need to specify I'm talking about the original series and not the franchise. Yes, yes. But like in the original series, you have like this recurring motif of what if what if children but terrible um so things like charlie yes. x for example things like yes. miri for example even in the third season and the children shall lead in which yeah. like a bunch of children murder an entire base which they're is always like, so scary yeah, yeah and it's weird because tng would endlessly go back to kids as you know being sometimes the conduit for i don't know imaginary friends or, or weird uh, things that are infecting the enterprise but ultimately a positive thing well yeah on on, on the next generation like Picard's skepticism of kids is treated as like a comedy character beat. Like yeah, it's, it's yeah. like the way of singling him out as an eccentric old man. Whereas yeah. like on, on Star Trek, you really get the sense that when kids show up, terrible, terrible bad, things bad are stuff. about to happen. Um, which which is and that's that's the tension. Is that like because again, as you point out, this is all written by greatest generation. Like they're all World War II. Yeah. Like Kuhn was a World War II veteran, um, Roddenberry was a World War II veteran, Freeberger himself was a World War II veteran. And so you have this idea of a world that is frantically changing um, yeah. and kind of like how how weird that is that said like and again this is where darren is about to give an episode of star trek far too much credit so brace yourself um right. but like one of the things i do actually quite like about that which survives is that like we've mentioned the interesting relationship that Star Trek has with Vietnam, where yes. the, the yes. historical narrative of Star Trek as, as advanced by certain Star Trek fans. And I understand why that is. And I think it's great. And I think, I think it's, it's good, but the narrative is like, Oh, Star Trek was, was so progressive and so far ahead of its time. And it absolutely was in certain cases. I would argue that like a taste of Armageddon, um, the trouble with tribbles, um, mm. the first, uh, errand of mercy are all like really, brutal cynical kind of critiques of the vietnam war um yeah. they're really cynical about american interventionism in vietnam but then on the other hand as you point out you have episodes like a private little war which is like oh man we have to intervene isn't that right. really sad for us isn't that really bad that we're going to have to like arm these people and have them kill each other um right. which is a very awkward thing and you have like the world is hollow and i've touched the sky you have this thing where and again, like even episodes like For the World is Hollow and I've Touched the Sky or Return of the Archerons or The Apple are like metaphors for, oh, man, the communists are doing something in Southeast Asia. We should really <laughs> intervene and stop them yeah. um, because they're like these soulless machine computers that are coming in and changing these societies. Man, I guess we have to intervene. Um, but I think that you could argue that which survives you know, if you were being very generous, and I don't think this is an intentional read, I don't think that anybody working on the script had this idea, but because yeah. when I was watching it, I was in a 60s headspace, because I was in a Star Trek headspace, and because I was in, like, particular Star Trek relationship to Vietnam headspace, you could conceivably read it as a metaphor for things like, say, landmines, or things like the lasting damage of Agent Orange, or, like, the lasting impact of war, because mm -hmm. you have this idea of a base or a defense mechanism that is in place and has been left and abandoned and which nobody remembers, uh, but which has lasting consequences. Uh, yeah. And so you have things like, like Vietnam that was happening at the moment, I think had like massive deployment of landmines going on. I think there are still landmines from that conflict that are being detonated today. There are still undisturbed deposits of Agent Orange and stuff like that. So I think that, mm -hmm. you know, if you, at a stretch, being very generous to this episode, you could read this as a vietnam metaphor not strongly and not as its primary facet and not in any way that i would defend 
but yeah. I think you can. Yeah, I think that that, I mean, I think that that fits. I don't think that that's too far uh, of an idea to to try to to encompass. And, you know, the politics of the show, uh, you know, are very reactionary, I think, generally. I mean, Star Trek is always about the time in which it's made, but it's also about the people who are, are making it. And you mentioned, um, I think in your season three review of the show, um, that there's an emphasis on the preservation of order in a lot of uh, this season, um, which is exactly what the people outside the studio are marching against for the most part. Yeah. But, you know, the 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 hippies all die uh, on Eden, uh, right? And um, the, the, the cloud minders, you know, uh, no, Metropolis is good, actually, and we can make it work <laughs> if we try really hard. Like, there's that reinforcement of, uh, of oh, authority. Of the norm order. or the value, like uh, the turnabout yeah. intruder, where it's like, yeah, you're right, maybe a woman shouldn't be captain. Yeah, maybe they're not cut up for it, yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe Genghis Khan is inherently evil, and Klingons are inherently evil. <laughs> right. uh, we don't want to we don't want to probe Abraham that one. Lincoln particularly. would always yeah. beat Genghis Khan. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, not like Abraham Abraham Lincoln won't beat him because he's got his stupid pacifist beliefs, and they'll take advantage. Right. You sure. need to be tough. You don't you sure. don't negotiate with people like that. Yeah. You punch him and beat him into submission. We'll uh, take care of this one, yeah. Abe. You just step back. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, you know, other series have survived transitions like the one that TOS found, finds itself at in 1969. Um, you know, TNG specifically obviously went for yeah. seven seasons um, and and went beyond. You know, we've talked in the past about Doctor Who and how it's had to change. And I think we talked last time about what a season four of Star Trek would look like. And I don't, I don't know if we came up with anything definitive, but <laughs> I'm once again reminded of that. Uh, sort of quandary, like if when they had gone to season four, if everything had worked out, you know, what would it have been? Would this um, sort of darker edge continue? Would the would the romance continue? You know, would the sex and death kind of continue? I mean, I, I find myself like the big what if about like a fourth season of Star Trek, uh, which I find fascinating to contemplate. And it like probably has no bearing on reality and probably has like Darren's been spending too much time like reading about 70s science fiction and pop culture because obviously that will take the show into the 70s. But yeah. my my big question is things like the moon landing, right? Because sure. like so much of the appeal of Star Trek comes at the time that it it's the result of like it's overlapping with NASA's commitment to getting a man on the moon. It's overlapping with the idea of like you know, the Russians beat us into space, but we're going to beat them to the moon. Um, that Kennedy era enthusiasm that kind of carries over past the assassination into the presidency of like Lyndon B. Johnson, the, the new frontier. You know, the final frontier is the new frontier. The, all the arguments that are made about Kirk as a John F. Kennedy figure. And I mean, you could argue that like the, the womanizing of Kirk in this season is leaning into the mythology of that. And you could argue that like hmm. the Federation utopianism is leaning into the whole for a brief shining moment. There was Camelot kind of mythology yeah. that. That's already building around Kennedy. And yeah. all of that is building towards the moon landing. And again, people have pointed out the the strange situation where you have, um, I can't remember precisely, but I think it, it's like it's two or three weeks before the moon landing is when the final episode of Star Trek airs, if I remember correctly, if my mm -hmm. chronology is not wrong. Um, but basically... You have this overlap between Star Trek and the moon landing. And it kind of almost syncs up perfectly. And what I think about is the fact that then once once mankind landed on the moon, that was really it for space exploration for the foreseeable future. Once we got there, we kind of discovered that ah, it's it's really it really is just rock up here. There's yeah. really kind of no sustainable future. We're not going to build a base up here. We're not going to use that base to try and get to Mars or anything like that. It's just like yeah. we we went there, we we put a flag and we came back. And you know, the last man on the moon was there only a couple of years after the first man on the moon. Um, we haven't continued to go up there. And like, there's an argument to be made by far smarter people than me um, that one of the big things about 70s science fiction in contrast to 60s science fiction, um, and again, not necessarily tied specifically to the moon landing, but arguably tied to just a broader sense of malaise, but things like, say, the Planet of the Apes saga, things like Logan's Run, where you have this idea that the, things like Soylent Green, things like the Omega Men, you have this idea that the, the future is progressively darker and this kind of push away from space-based science fiction and like even when space-based science fiction kind of comes back in a big way in the late 70s with star wars it's a used future it's not a pristine bright like you know utopian future it's like the future 
that you were promised from the 50s, but it's been allowed to rust and decay because nobody cares about it. That yeah. that moment where like they're traveling the Millennium Falcon, they say that's no moon and it isn't a moon. It's a giant man-made death station um, mm-hmm. that is just kind of devoid of life. And I do wonder if Star Trek, the original series, had continued past the moon landing, like what would that have been like? Because, like, you had this big, like, brief shining moment, all of mankind is one stuff. But then afterwards, you had this kind of hangover of, well, that that's it then, is it? That's that's what we were building towards. And I do wonder, like, how would, how you would reconcile with that, whether kind of literally or, or metaphorically, I suppose. That's my yeah. kind of, like, that's my hypothetical Star Trek continues kind of conundrum. That's the circle that I wonder about squaring. Because I wonder if it's like, um, if you ever watch, do you watch The X-Files? Do you watch The X-Files? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So um, you're, the X-Files kind of was, again, massively popular in the 90s because it tapped into this kind of cynicism paranoia. But its final season had the misfortune of launching in September 2001, yeah. um, just like days after September the 11th. And there was this yeah. huge drop in viewership. And like Carter made the point that like he felt the show was done because after 9-11, nobody wanted to watch a show about how you don't trust the government anymore. <laughs> uh, now, yeah. to be fair, the ninth season of the X-Fall is like terrible. Uh, and it's I'm not, not defending, no. it's not good. It's a terrible piece of television. But yeah. I do think that like the fact that the, the ratings dropped so dramatically and so suddenly suggests that Carter might've been onto something. And I do wonder if a version of Star Trek that continues past the moon landing would face a similar cultural moment, perhaps. I mean, yeah. it's similar to the um, if if you ever read the kind of the um, the Phase Two book, I, I think that was it written by the Okudas. Um, but the the Phase Two book makes an interesting argument that like if Star Trek Phase Two had aired, it may have actually prematurely killed the franchise just due to landing at the time and place that it would have landed in American network television history. Yeah, um, and I do wonder if there's a sense of it's terrible that Star Trek the the third season of Star Trek ended when it did. But part of me is also like, is that ending just short of that landmark? Is that what kept it alive long enough for it to kind of gestate? Uh, disappearing in time to not have to compete with uh, yeah. Battlestar Galactica or Space 1999 or any yeah. of these other shows that weren't so uh, utopic. Um, just thinking about like a movie like Silent Running <laughs> and like having to have put Star Trek <laughs> up against like Silent Running. It's just like two completely different things. Uh, you know, it, all, everything, uh, this too shall pass, good things and bad things. And there will definitely be more Trek in the future uh, that is inspiring. Or there'll be something completely different. There'll be some other property, some other franchise, something else to dig your teeth into. Uh, I, I just like the fact that in this episode specifically, they reverse the polarity, speaking of Doctor <laughs> Very Who. Doctor and Who-ish. Scotty even uses a screwdriver analog to do it. Yeah. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of really, really good stuff here. I Again, I really like... I love, by the way, the fact that they freeze the image of Lee Merriweather on the least flattering image of, like, the most beautiful woman on the planet where she's blinking. <laughs> yes. It's like we yes. stop the image and it's like, oh, she's... she's. Uh, she, could you get one with her eyes open? It's like, no, yeah. no I, don't, I don't really Beauty, think so. Yeah, no. Beauty survives. <laughs> forever oh, yeah. with her but, eyes closed <laughs> again like yeah very much a kind of a 60s thing where it's like oh woman she's beautiful that's that's your takeaway kirk that there was a hot woman on this planet not a meditation <laughs> and he goes back in on it because they even have spock point out uh it's pretty cool that she's real smart though right and yeah. kirk's like i don't think so i don't think so she's beautiful yeah just the main thing to take away from is the fact that yeah that, that she's a really stunning woman um, she could play like Catwoman or something just to be safe and that is the only thing of consequence that survived from her entire culture um all right then let's get the hell out of here all right well um, we're out of here yeah, yeah. <laughs> what a crazy thing. little planet yeah <laughs> what a goofy adventure that was <laughs> <laughs> but i i do and I, I will shout out like i do like the purpleness of the episode as well actually, yeah which yeah feels like and again i think like this is again recycled and again we talk about the lasting legacy of the third season of star trek notable this is one of the episodes that is recycled for the first season of the next generation so like i love that like when they're doing the greatest hits of star trek they're like okay fine we're gonna do a uh, space seed and balance of terror we're gonna do that as the neutral zone we're gonna do it as a comedy for some reason but don't ask we're gonna do the devil in the dark which is like and we're gonna do that as home soil it's like okay fine let's do another one uh, it's like that which survives we'll do it as, as arsenal of freedom that work yeah yeah right. yeah yeah you know classic right. 
Yeah, that's I was I uh, just I read that uh, or you mentioned that in one of your um, in your review of it later. But as I was watching it, I, that just kind of came to me organically. I was like, oh my god, this is this is just the arsenal of freedom. <laughs> and I know that TNG, you know, did that a lot. They took unpublished scripts or they just took like, oh, let's just do this premise over again. But yeah, that's exactly what but, it is. But it's like do this premise over again. It's like you understand doing like Devil in the Dark because Devil in the Dark is like one of the iconic Star Trek stories to the point where like this episode references Devil in the Dark, like Devil yeah. in the dark is like such a quintessential piece of star trek and you you recognize space seed because that in, that introduces khan you want to do like a uh, balance of terror because that's the romulan so you, you see why they pick those episodes and yeah. like as somebody who's like that which survives is massively underrated even i'm like is this really the, the one you want to pick for a remake is this really yeah. the one you want to do over on um yeah but with a little dash of like 80s uh commercialism Vincent uh and Vincent Chavelli, yeah, and, and like an arms dealing, maybe like an anti-war message. It's uh, it's dilute. It was Re- Reagan era. Like again, that that first season sure. of Star Trek. Like again, we talk about like meaning and all that sort of stuff. I do love that even the first season of the Next Generation, which is not a good season of television, is no. very very interested in Reagan era politics. Oh yeah, everybody's putting weapons and... everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody's <laughs> shipping weapons illegally everywhere. Um, yeah. It, before we go, just one more thing I want to single out. I actually like that the attention the episode pays to D'Amato's kind of funeral. Uh, because, like, you yes. point out that this is one of the last times that the show, like, does the killing of the red shirt, although he's not technically a red shirt. Sure. But I, I love that, like, how much time the episode spends on, well, he's dead and we're stuck on a planet with his body. we got to yeah. figure out what to do. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know that it's like it is a plot function because the entire point is that they realize they can't just phase the ground. So it's like, oh, my God, this planet is, is dense rock. But yes, I, I, yes. I love that it's like, no, we, we do actually have to pay attention to the fact that this is death death has happened here i also yeah. love by the way that nobody seems to know his first name does it's, he have his, a first name yeah <laughs> lieutenant it, lt his, lt his, yeah. do, do you reckon they beamed his body up like after like when they left do you reckon or did they just leave him on the planet i don't know what procedure is i always wondered if kirk is just stuck on viridian 3 forever if yeah. they ever brought his uh, bones back to to iowa yeah because you, you do kind of wonder then like if they do that is like picard like well i lifted all those rocks for nothing and it oh, was very boy. hot yeah. <laughs> well, uh, at the end of the show here, let's talk about Space Dads. Last last episode, you said that Cisco was your favorite captain. Uh, one of the reasons is that he's not a micromanager. How do you think that he would have dealt with either the planet or the shipboard situation in this case? I, I don't imagine he would have been quite as patient as Kirk or Spock in this situation. Uh, mm. what, again, like my... my my big kind of like I, I think I've talked about this before, but like my big moments in terms of like characterization of Cisco in the first season of Deep Space Nine are like when he's stranded on the surface of the planet in battle lines, and Bashir is like, "What about the Prime Directive?" and Cisco just pushes him against the road about, and it's like, "Yeah, I don't really care about the Prime Directive. Yeah. You you will do what I tell you to do." Yeah. Um, or the moment in um, what's the episode Dramatis Personae where he kind of flings himself over into the pit, and it's like, "Yeah, I want to get in this." fight sequence so i kind of i don't imagine he would be quite as like solemn um or kind of like you know kind of like leadership uh, oriented as kirk i don't imagine he would be as deadpan as spock i imagine if they were making this episode and again one of the things that i I kind of i think i mentioned it when i talked about why cisco is my favorite space dad is that like Every episode of the original series and every episode of The Next Generation seems to have to find something for Shatner or Stewart to do, which makes sense because they're they're really good actors. They give really good performances and they're an iconic part of the show, particularly on right. the original series where you literally only have three leads. Um, so they always have to find something for them. And because like Shatner was very jealous, he would count the lines and see how many lines Nimoy had. <laughs> yes, Whereas yes. Deep Space Nine was quite happy to have Cisco like drift off for like particular episodes where he would appear in a single scene. If even he might appear in a quick shot, there are episodes where Cisco doesn't appear. I kind of wonder if this would be one of those episodes Hmm. where like, if Cisco were on the defiant, when this happened, you would focus more on like O'Brien in the Scotty role, trying to figure out what the problem is Mm -hmm. rather Mm -hmm. than the bridge. And if it happened on the planet, you'd probably have, I don't know, say Bashir trying to figure out what the problem is. And Cisco just standing over the, the graves being really morose, mourning D'Amato, probably 
would it be closer to the ship? It might be close. I suppose you could probably argue that the planet-based plot would be relatively close to the ship, where you would have Dax and you'd have Cisco being angry, and you'd possibly have the situation escalating without the intervention um, <laughs> of uh, Lor- uh, Laros. Uh, was it? Uh, sorry, Lasiris. Lasiris. Yeah, Lysiris. yeah, yeah. That's it's interesting. And if he was, you know, a shipboard in this case, that not the Enterprise made the Defiant. Uh, I don't know if he would have the same role as Spock does with his weird like calculator thing that he's playing <laughs> with the entire episode, which never exactly pays off. Like, it's not like he I've got it. You know, the, uh, this is the exact number that we need to make the, the reversal happen. You know, I almost it, it reminded me of um, like almost like a cane mutiny kind of moment. Like he's fiddling with this thing, like fiddling with the cards like Decker does in uh, in um the uh, ultimate weapon or whatever that yeah. episode's called. Um, I never really understood what the, uh, the payoff was supposed to be for him oh, uh, fiddling machine, right? with this little thing. Yeah. The doomsday machine. Yeah. Uh, what he's, what he's fiddling with this entire time. I have no idea. Like part of me wonders if that was like a Nimoy suggestion when he looked at the script and saw all of the numbers in it, where he's like, just Look, give me Spock's, a little. Spock's yeah, not give a computer. An actor, just, yeah, give just, an actor a prop and that, yeah, he'll he'll run with it. That's it exactly. Which reminds me of uh, Cisco in Dramatis Personae when he's, uh, <laughs> he is supposed to be crazy, but he's playing with the little clock the entire time. Yeah. I mean, like, the, the thing is, and again, not not to hark back on Bashir, but like the, the sequence where he's, or Spock is giving all of those statistics reminds me of that bit in the, at the start of the sixth season of Deep Space Nine. So when you had that revelation that Bashir was genetically engineered in Dr. Bashir, I presume, the yeah. writers were like, eh, we should probably do do something with that and their response was like in the opening stretch of the sixth season to have him just give numbers to to state the odds like <laughs> right. to, uh, yeah ins- and like i love that uh alexander siddick or siddick uh kind of like response to that was to like read the lines with as little energy or enthusiasm as possible in order to send <laughs> the message to the production team that this is not how he wanted the character to be written again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so like that that's what i think about when i think about like spock talking about 11.337 hours or yeah. 14.87 minutes um i kind yeah. of like Part of me wonders if the calculator was Nimoy going, you know what, look, I'll do this, but only if I can, like, pretend to play with a calculator. Yeah. That or I did read that part of his uh, problems at the beginning of the third season was he was sick of Spock being characterized as just, like, the guy who does an eyebrow and goes, hmm, fascinating, and just leaves the room. And so <laughs> it's just like he's trying to show, oh, no, I can do lines, but I can do prop and space work as well. He's trying to, like, broaden the character of Spock in this way. I love, by the way, the, that makes sense because it is interesting that you have, like, the fascinating line goes to Kirk in the opening scene. Yeah. It's Kirk who says might even be fascinating. So maybe yeah. maybe you're onto something there. Um, Possible. Like, <laughs> it is weird that they find this amazing scientific discovery and then Spock just stays on the ship, though. Yeah. As um, the science officer. Well, you know, again, one, one reckons that maybe keeping Shatner and Nimoy separated at this point in the third <laughs> season was a good call for all involved. Absolutely a good call. <laughs> now that we've reached the end of the show, you'll receive a promotion to the rank of lieutenant junior grade. And I think last time we determined that you were uh, working on the ship as a 20th century pop culture historian. If you beamed down to a strange planet with an away team and happen to die in some comic book related disaster <laughs> would you want to be buried in comic books as our geologist is buried in rocks i mean like as somebody who lives in a house that is literally made of comic books it's great insulation uh, and it, it seems to last for i mean like this this hasn't been as lasted six years so far so i think it's a pretty sturdy plan yeah you know i yeah. mean I, I feel like my problem in, in being down to the planet of that which survives is that it's obviously like it's a reference to like the odyssey which is not 20th century history. So I would just be dead mm. immediately because I don't know what you Cyrus You just are. would have no, yeah, yeah. no. I'd be like, I don't understand no the reference the to this thing. It's like, yeah, damn it. We should have brought the uh, the classic Greek historian. Outside, yeah, right. Uh, outside of the um, the fact that they don't know his first name, like the fact that they want to bury him in rocks is just proof that they didn't know anything about this guy. <laughs> well, yeah, he's like, a geologist, Kirk... right? He's he's happy now. Yeah. Yeah, Kirk has that line where it's like fitting, and it's like that's your eulogy. <laughs> that's that's like your big takeaway. Right. It's... right. We well, want like, to bury the chef in spaghetti. Like it's not. It's not the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's more than like. Does anybody want to say anything nice about Lieutenant Tomato? It's like, yeah, I feel like you know. It's, it's rocks. It's fitting, right? It's he's where he wants to be. Yeah. 
Is that died peace? doing what he loves. I, yeah. <laughs> which kind of like in hindsight does make that observation that they have before they beam down, where it's like, be quite the presentation to the fifth geologist convention. Seem like the most mundane sort of small talk imaginable. It's yeah, like, right. wh- what do I know about this guy? Uh, his name's <laughs> D'Amato and he likes rocks. So uh, yeah, you're yeah. going to do a presentation on the rocks for the yeah. other rock people, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant? Yeah, that's your name. Yeah. yeah. Lou. Everybody just calls him Lou. <laughs> yeah, he's called him Lou. <laughs> well, Lieutenant Mooney, thanks for joining me to talk about Star Trek and the Star Trek universe. And if people want to continue the conversation, and they can, at at EISTpod on Twitter and the Enterprising Individuals Facebook page, where can people find you online? Uh, absolutely everywhere. Um, no, you, you gave a very good rundown at the start of the episode, so I'm not going to sure. bore people by running again. Um, sure. But yeah, so The Escapist Magazine, uh, the movie blog with a zero instead of an O in the word movie, uh, Google mm-hmm. of my name, uh, Twitter at Darren underscore Mooney, the podcast called The 250, any of those places you can find me online. I'm fairly easy to find. So yep, please check them all out. And I'll have uh, links to all those in the show notes too, so people can find those easily. Well, we're signing off until the next mission, Hailing Frequencies Closed. Yeah.